If you haven't been with us through the Lent season, we've had a sermon series focused on Paul's letters. Learned a lot from them. Uh, this week, we're reflecting on Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. The main question that I'll be reflecting on is if, if, Paul, if Paul were to write this letter to, to our church, would he be saying the things that he's saying in this letter? Or, or if he were just writing it to me individually? Or to you, reflect upon it. Would he, would he be saying these things? The letters that he's written are to churches that he started, and it's, uh, it'd be curious to see what he would have to say. The main things that he says in this letter uh, all can be seen really in chapter 1, and then he unpacks them for the rest of, of the book, which is only five chapters, is... Uh, one, he, he's, he's celebrating. He is incredibly grateful for the, the church at, at Thessalonica. And he's grateful and celebrating for, for the gospel that, that, that got to them, that made it to them, that was delivered to them. He was grateful for the gospel that was delivered to them, and he was grateful that the gospel worked in them, not just delivered to them, to the front porch of their heart, so to speak, but after knocking, the door was opened, and sure enough, they invited the gospel in, and it started to have an effect, started to give a a, a facelift to the interior of their heart. So he celebrated that the gospel made it to them, he celebrated that it worked in them, and the main thing that I want to reflect on Because I'm pretty sure if Paul were to write this letter to us, he would celebrate that the gospel made it to you. And um, I'd say at least most of us, the gospel's been invited in and and has been changing us. Some of y'all might have just been born wonderful people. I don't know. I wasn't. But but what I what I question as to whether he would write this to me or to us is is the last one. He celebrates with them not just the gospel got to them, not just the gospel got in them, but that the gospel subsequently rang out from them. This is the book of Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8. I'll just read this one verse. He says, the Lord's message rang out. When you hear the word rang, think echo, just just continued to penetrate further and further away. The Lord's message rang out from you, and not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Uh, Thessalonica would be a, a very wealthy capital province of Macedonia. So when you hear Paul or anyone else speak of of uh, Macedonia. They're probably talking about the church there at Thessalonica, but I celebrate that the gospel that got to you, the gospel that that wrecked you on the inside, it's also ringing out from you, and, and not just in your church, not just in your family, not just in your life. It's, it's ringing out outside of your church into the town into the towns around you. It's, it's just breaking out, ringing out. Now, I'm not trying to say that only the third thing is important. In fact, all three things are very important to celebrate. That it came to them was a big deal. For Paul to even get to Macedonia or, or Thessalonica was, was a trial. He had just, you can read about him getting to uh, Thessalonica in Acts 16. I invite you to read it, 16 and 17. He had just gotten out of uh, jail in Philippi. He wanted to stay in Philippi longer, but was forced out, was persecuted to the point of forcing him out of that town. And on his way out, let's just say without recapping uh, too much scripture, he wanted to go this way and couldn't, and then he wanted to go this way and couldn't, so he had to go this way. And he ended up taking 
the, uh, the Roman road, which is called the Ignatian Way, which is about a 700-mile stretch between Istanbul and the Adriatic Sea. And I know what you're thinking. Oh, yeah, the, the Ignatian Way. Now I know where Thessalonica is. But just in case that didn't ring a bell, it's in the northern part of Greece. And when he finally got to Thessalonica, it says in Acts 17, 6, that he was there for three week, three Sabbath days, which basically means three weeks. And he was persecuted and pushed out of that town as well. It says of his enemies, this is in Acts 17, that they said of Paul, we've got to get him out of here because he is turning the world upside down. Interesting. Not just turning this church upside down, not just turning the lives of a few people upside down, not just turning this town upside down. His message is having such an effect that it's going to turn the world upside down. So he leaves and get this, travels about 45 miles away to a town in Berea and his persecutors were so intent upon pushing him out, they followed he, him even there, 45 miles away. Now this is at a time when you know people aren't just cruising around in golf carts, okay? It's Pat and Charlie walking all the way. That's some serious stuff. And when he finally gets far enough to where they're not messing with him, Acts 18 says that Timothy and Silas, who were spending time in Thessalonica, found Paul and let him know. Just because we're being persecuted over there does not mean the church is being stomped out. In fact, they tell him, the church is busting out at the seams. The, the idea being, the fact that the gospel got to them was no small thing. Darkness knew that if the gospel reached the Thessalonians, that they too would find power over death and power over sin, both of, both of which were being leveraged for the sake of control. Any power that has the, the, uh, the leverage of death over you, if you think this life is all there is, they're going to have some serious control over you. Sin has control over us. Our attachments to this world leads us to overconsumption in many ways. But if the message of Jesus gets to the Thessalonians or you, then in the resurrection you must know that there's more to life than just this life. This is why the disciples would stand firm in the face of martyrdom. And it means that we have some release from this grip that sin has in our life. We find freedom in the name of Jesus. Darkness didn't want this to happen. But it got to them. And it changed their lives from the inside out. Darkness was so intent on keeping this from happening. This is why Jesus died. This is why all of the disciples, save one, became a martyr. The gospel getting to you is no small thing, is what I'm trying to press in. This is why the, form, uh, the reformers were persecuted. This is why preachers work so hard, day in and day out, to get the gospel to you. It's no small thing. Not only was he celebrating that the gospel got to them, but he was celebrating that it worked him over from the inside out. He said in verse 6, You became imitators of us. Paul and his comrades would show unconditional surrender to Jesus in the presence of the Thessalonians. Unconditional. Lord, what you want for me, the thing that you want me to stop doing, I surrender it to you. The thing that you want me to start doing, I surrender to you. Uh, and asking for God's provision to do such. They would imitate Paul and his comrades to the extent that they too would start experiencing these, these elevated levels of joy and peace and love and hope. And when these soul vitamins rose to the place where they need to be, they started experiencing the mind of Christ. And this was something that in no way were they going to trade. Jesus started wrecking them from the inside out. This is, this is definitely my story. I know that before I started following Jesus, my life was indeed a wreck. And I believe if I ceased following Jesus, my life would probably go back to being a wreck. And there's no way that I'm going to change that. Now, the gospel getting to me is one thing, getting to you. The gospel being invited into the interior of our life is another thing. It ringing out is something totally different. The gathering in Thessalonica Paul was celebrating was multiplying. They had found the solution to the life they wanted. 
and they weren't going to keep it to themselves. They wanted other people to know. Or to put it negatively, they found a cure for an illness that they wanted, and there's no way they were going to hide it. They wanted people to experience it as well. As well. But the gospel doesn't always do this. I must, I must say that I easily celebrate that the gospel got to me. I easily celebrate that it has worked me over from the inside out to the, to the point that I am a much better representation of myself than I would have been otherwise. And you might be saying, well, you're not that good. Well, you didn't know me before. Much better. But I don't always see the gospel ringing out for me. I like what it does for me. I don't, I don't necessarily go out and seek every day to make sure it gets in the life of other people. Well, you do it on Sunday. Well, I get paid to do it, and it's kind of my vocation. If you follow me around every day, I'm not always letting the gospel ring out. And I'm guessing if I have this same predisposition, I like that it got to me, I like what it does for me, I don't always like to share it, that maybe there may be, I don't know, one or two in here that may have the same issue. The truth is that part of what Paul is celebrating is something that Jesus taught all of us to do. To be fishers of men. Matthew 4.19, Luke 5.10, and Mark 1.17 shows all of them saying the same thing. Preserving this for everyone who would hear their representation of Jesus' life. They would say of him that he taught one day. He began by saying, just follow me. That's the starting point. But eventually he would say, and now as you're following me, I'm going to make you fishers of men. This is the goal. The gospel is not just going to get to the porch of your heart. The gospel is not just going to come inside and change you. But I'm, I want you to take that and offer it to other people so that their lives can be changed as well. So how do we do this? When there is, I would say, some measure of resistance. How do we do this? I would say, do it. It's, it, it's really a simple concept. Uh, and if you make it a practice, it would become an atomic practice in your life. You just got to get it started. And that is do what Paul did in this letter. Celebrate what God is doing. You may start in your own life. Look, as he's celebrating what's going on in Thessalonica, it's not like everything over in Thessalonica is rainbows, unicorns, and lollipops. There were some tough things going on in Macedonia and Thessalonica, but that is not what he focused on. He focused on what God was doing in the lives of the people there, springing out of the lives of the people there. So as you're looking on your own life, make that a practice. What is God doing in my life? Are there things in your life where you could say, well, what is God not doing in my life? Yes. Are there some poopy things in your life? I'm sure it is part of the human condition. But if you want to celebrate what God is doing, that is a totally different perspective. Look for what God is doing. This is a way of making the gospel your own. It's interesting that Paul would say in verse 5 of chapter 1, we came to you with our gospel. Now that doesn't mean Paul is saying he, he designed the gospel or he, he wrote the gospel. He's saying, I own the gospel. In other words, it, it's a part of my life. Are you able to celebrate what God is doing in your life in light of the gospel? Or is the gospel in your life just an accident of geography? In other words, you, you happen to grow up in a Christian home, and so because your parents are at church, well, I guess I'm going to go to church, and that's the gospel in your life. Or maybe it never happened for you, but you want, to ha want it to happen for your kids, and so now you're going to church for your kids to get it, but you never quite owned the gospel for yourself. I would invite you simply to open up a file in your brain and start dropping information in it to this question. What is God doing in my life for the good? Start celebrating what God is doing, and you may come to own the gospel for yourself. Celebrate what you see God is doing, not only in your own life. Here's another thing to do. Paul wasn't just talking about what God was doing in general. Paul was talking about what he saw God doing in the lives of the Thessalonians. Okay, so hear this. Start looking for what you see God doing in the lives of people around you and celebrate it. 
there's plenty to look around and see what's miserable on social media or on the news. I mean, it's all out there. And my guess is 80% of the stuff we talk about is littered with that information. Try something different. Look for what God is doing in someone's life. And when you see it, celebrate it in the life of a friend, in the life of a business associate, in the life of a relative, in the life of a neighbor down the street. Just start looking for what God is doing, and I bet you'll be surprised at the things you see. And then when you see it happen, go to that person and celebrate it. All of a sudden, you're sharing the gospel in your life. You're enabling them to get excited like Paul got excited when he heard about the things going on in Thessalonica. You see, you don't have to memorize a chapter and verse and walk someone through it. Okay, for God so loved the world. No, no, for for God, God, right, for God. You don't have to do all that. Name what God is doing in their life and just say, man, that's great. I see that happening. Celebrate what God is doing in your life. Celebrate what God is doing in in someone else's life. And then here's, here's something. Align your prayer life with that. Barna Research, which is kind of like what Gallup is for politics, it is for religion. They did a study on uh, the religious life of folks who start faith, and there's a graph that goes something like this. When, when 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 they first get the gospel, it shoots up, and there's like this crest, but then over time, it starts to come down. And I wonder if it's because at the beginning when we receive the gospel, once we start making it our own, if we're doing one and two, the gospel has come to our house. You know how like when, you, when the package gets to your house and your email's like, your package has arrived, and you get all excited? So the package of the gospel gets to your house. You're excited. You go home and you open it up. That's even more exciting, right? And you ordered a picture. You want it on the wall. You do it or, or some sheets, and you put them on your bed, whatever. You bring it into your house. The package is affecting the interior of your life. Everything's great, but then there's another step, and maybe we just never quite get around to it. The other step, it's not just about receiving it and bringing it in and changing our life, but it's about offering it to those around us, making fishers of men. And it might be that you're on this downward trend in your faith, if you are, because you've done step one and two with glee, but you haven't gotten around to being a fisher of men. Let me give you this illustration. Uh, This applies to a lot of things if you don't use it properly. Uh, When I was young, I was very active in doing art. I loved art. I didn't know you were an artist. Well, you don't know a lot of things about me. I got got some drawings in my office that you would probably be surprised about. But when I got about 15 or 16, I just got bored with it. And those um, skills just sort of lay dormant. I thought, I thought, well, maybe this whole art thing is over. I went about five or ten years not doing anything. But then I started following this guy named Jesus, and I started becoming a parent. And these two things meant I was no longer the center of the universe, which I was kind of missing. But other people were more important to me. And then when I started doing things for other people, all of a sudden, my art started coming out again. Because Maybe I got, I got tired of doing art just for myself and the gifts got stirred up again because I was finally doing them for other people. And I think the same thing could happen about the gospel in your life. If your gospel has just been about you, that's okay at first because it's supposed to get to you. It's supposed to transform your life. You're supposed to see the levels of love, joy, peace, and hope come up in your life. But at some point, God doesn't want to just keep filling you up and filling you up and filling you up and filling you up. You know, you're like a balloon. You're going to pop with faith. You've got to start giving it out to people. And maybe if you will take this third step, you'll see that, that, that faith talent that you had at one time stir back up. You may have some other resistances. Um, you may think, well, I'm not like a... a a trained person like you. I'm not well thought of like a pastor. I can't do that. Well, hear this. You need to read Thessalonians. Okay, Paul had to defend himself in this letter. He wasn't well thought of by everyone. If you think it's because you're well thought of that you have the justification to share faith with someone else, uh, then you haven't read scripture. I don't know who ripped Thessalonians out of your Bible, but Paul had to defend himself, so, so don't say that. Or you think, well, Uh, perhaps you're supposed to be morally impeccable before you can share 
your faith with anyone else. Well, hear me. Paul is celebrating the church at Thessalonica, but he's also instructing them about some sexual infidelity that's going on in that church. They were not morally impeccable, yet still God was using them to spread the gospel throughout the world. Or maybe you, you might think, well, I, I don't have sound doctrine like you do, Brother Adam. I don't, I don't understand theology. How can I share? What? Neither did Thessalonica. Paul had to instruct this church on doctrine that they had gotten totally wrong. But that doesn't mean that God can't work through your life. Offer it to someone. We're called to be fishers of men. I have this story that I came across recently. I've never shared this uh, in church, well, except for, uh, of course, at the early service. I'd like to share it with you now. It has much to do with us being fishers of men and whether Paul would write this letter to us. Hear this. A, a group existed who called themselves fishermen. There were many fish in the waters all around. In fact, the whole area was surrounded by streams, lakes, filled with fish. The fish were hungry. Week after week, month after month, those who were calling themselves fishermen met in meetings. There they talked about their call to fish, the abundance of fish, how they might go about fishing. They believed that everyone should be a fisherman, that everyone should fish. But the one thing... They did not do. <laughs> they did not fish. In addition to meeting regularly, they organized a board to send out fishermen to other places where there were more fish. The board would hire staff, appoint committees, held many meetings so that they could properly define fishing and defend fishing from anyone who would define it otherwise. But the staff, the committee members, didn't actually fish. Large, elaborate, expensive training centers were built with the original purpose being to teach fishermen how to fish. They only taught fishing. After tedious training, many graduated giving licenses. They were sent to do full-time fishing. But like the fishermen back home, they never actually fished. They engaged in all sorts of occupations, but not actual fishing. After one stirring meeting of the necessity of fishing, the importance of fishing, one young fellow got up and decided, I think I'll go fishing. The next day he reported that he caught two outstanding fish. He was honored, scheduled to visit all the big meetings possible to tell them how he did it. So he stopped fishing in order to have time to tell about his experience to all the different meeting places. One day someone suggested, that those who didn't catch fish really weren't fishermen, no matter how much they came to the meetings. The question was pondered by many. Is a person a fisherman if he doesn't really catch fish? And if the master said, quote, follow me, and I will make you fisher of men, end quote, is one following really if he's not fishing. So ask yourself one of these questions sometime today before we go into communion. Number one, in what ways do you own the gospel? Is the gospel yours? In what ways do you own the gospel? Has the gospel been to the interior of your life to the extent that you could answer the question, what difference has it made in your life? How is your life better? because of the gospel? How would it be worse if you didn't have the gospel? In what ways do you own the gospel? Is it yours? Or is it just an accident of geography? Or two, how is the gospel graph trending in your life? Some people start off great because they got one and two. The package is delivered. I open the package. It looks great in my house. It matches all my colors. I love it. But in step three, it trends down. Is the gospel graph, graph trending down or is it trending up? Sure, you have some hills and valleys, but for the most part, it's trending up. How is the gospel graph trending in your life? Or finally, 
when is the last time you went fishing?